I'm Scott Snibby, and this is A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment. Teenagers face a unique and overwhelming set of problems today, from climate change to social media to isolation induced by the pandemic. Richard Prince is a marriage, child, and family counselor who has worked as a teen counselor in the Cupertino, California public schools for over 20 years. He's also a longtime Buddhist practitioner and a good friend of mine who served as the director of the Vajrapani Institute Buddhist Retreat Center in Boulder Creek when His Holiness the Dalai Lama came to visit in 1989. In our interview, Rich and I talk about some of the powerful ways parents can transform their own minds to better help their teens, as well as helping teens to transform themselves. Even if you're not a parent or teen, I think you'll find Rich's wisdom inspiring in offering practical ways to deal with difficult emotions and the world's problems. So, Rich, it's a pleasure having you on A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment. You and I have been friends, Dharma friends. We've been on retreats together, and I'm really excited to talk to you today, particularly about teens and parenting teens and how we can apply some ideas from meditation and Buddhism to doing those jobs a little better. (laughs) Sounds good. So to start out, Rich, can you tell me a little bit about your Buddhist background and also your background counseling teens? Yeah, I was at Berkeley in 67 to 71. I did some some Buddhist classes while I was there. I got a little interested, even though I went to India and Nepal when I started traveling. It wasn't until I got to Australia that I met Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa Rinpoche. So uh, that was in 1974. They gave two month-long courses on the complete Buddhist path. Then I stayed and did a two-month retreat. So... That's where it started, and then uh, we came back and eventually got involved with Vajrapani Institute in helping bring uh, Buddhist teachings to the West. Many teachers came to our center, many lamas that escaped Tibet in in 59 when the Chinese invaded. Amazing teachings they gave. Very fortunate to be there at that time. We built this retreat center. I was, you know, trying to make that happen, attending teachings, doing retreats there. And then uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama came just like nine days after he got the Nobel Peace Prize, came to our center. I was director at the time. We got to hang out, just the people at the center. We had a private interview with him. And and he said, you know, there's a couple things. One is I would really suggest you fix the road. It's really dusty (laughs) because we had a mile and a half of dirt road. The other is... He really recommended that Buddhists, Western Buddhists, you know, he didn't encourage people to convert to Buddhism. He said, we should really learn from Christians and do more community work. Mm. And I thought I should think about going to grad school and furthering that because I've been doing a lot of carpentry to build a center. I've been working outside as a carpenter. I'm probably not going to be that excited about building fancy houses for people. That really inspired me to go to grad school in my 40s and make a big change and then become a therapist. I didn't realize it was the Dalai Lama who gave you the advice to go and try to... It wasn't personally, it was to a group, but it really struck home. That made sense because I didn't feel like I was helping people so much by taking two weeks to trim out their front door in carpentry. So it was a good switch for me. And can you talk about where that led, what you studied and how you became a teen counselor? Oh, you know, you have to pick a grad school somewhere that offers a program and I'm a marriage, family, child counselor. So I decided to do the the master's program so I could get into it because I just I wanted to do counseling. I didn't want to do research or testing. As you do that program, you have to do 3,000 hours of internship. So my internship was partly in a parent center, but it was partly because I wanted to get training in narrative therapy. I worked through a narrative therapy clinic that had placements for us to work in high schools, junior high schools, and elementary schools. So for two years, I was doing that. One of the settings was at a high school, working with severely emotionally disturbed kids. That's, that was the name of the class. And while I was there, the state <laughs> changed the designation to emotionally disturbed. And one of the kids said to me, hey, they didn't consult us. We've been ripped off. We're severely emotionally disturbed. <laughs> God. And then when I got to where I could start looking for a job, getting licensed, then I knew somebody was leaving a high school. And so I've been at the same high school for 21 years now, mm-hmm. just about ready to retire. And what high school is that? Oh, uh, it's Monte Vista High School in Cupertino, California. So you mentioned to me something about 
parents who struggle with parenting teens. You said everybody has a driver's license, but nobody has a license to parent, (laughs) which I like a lot. I'm a parent of a soon-to-be teen. You teach a class for the parents of teens. Can you talk about what you do in that class? How do you teach parents to be better parents? One of the things I really like that I've done in the course is that because I would, when I was doing internship, I would attend seminars on how to help teens, Mm -hmm. but there were never any teens in the room. It was all well-meaning adults. So I decided I wanted to have teens in these parenting classes. So the teens, I was able to recruit teens from the physiology class. The teacher gave them credit to come to my parenting class. And most of the parents in the class, their teens are freshmen and sophomores mostly. And these teens were juniors and seniors. So they they really had been through it. And I said to them, I want you to keep me honest. So if I misrepresent you or I, you know, I, I make a mistake that isn't in your experience, because they have insider knowledge. And also I asked them if they could help the parents do exercises, like listening exercises, learning how to problem solve, and be advisors, be consultants to the parents. So here are teens getting a parenting class before they can even get a driver's license, some of them, which is really fantastic in my mind, you know, to get that kind of training. So what are some of the issues parents face with their teens, and how do you help parents deal with those? Yeah. Before issues, I think the main thing is to learn just basic awareness and communication. So sort of how to talk to themselves, how to communicate with themselves, and how to communicate with others. So there's a lot of groundwork, like building a house. And they want to do this too, Scott. Let's get to the issues. What do you do about yeah, yeah. social media? This is a two-story house, and that's the bedroom upstairs, okay? That's the bathroom upstairs. And so we have to lay a foundation first. We've got to get permits. The foundation is more like, that's why it's eight weeks long. First week, just look at your mind. What kind of emotions come up when you're talking to your teen or when there's a problem? There, there are certain emotions that if we operate out of them, it's not so effective. Not only does psychology talk about that, Western psychology, but Buddhist psychology also speaks to that. If we're angry when we're trying to deal with somebody, it's probably not going to go so well. Or if we're annoyed, or if we're feeling hurt. It doesn't mean we can't have those feelings. It doesn't mean that we don't address those. Maybe work on them <laughs> ourselves first. So to be more effective, like instead of being angry, Maybe it's more like to recognize what might be going on. Why am I angry? What's upsetting me? It's not going my way. Maybe this is a power struggle. I need to take a time out. So it's more about a parent learning how to take care of themselves, having compassion for themselves, understanding for themselves, knowing where they're coming from, why they're annoyed, what they're feeling. Did something happen at work today? You know, what do I need to work on, you know, before I have this conversation so I can be effective parent? Because parents want to be good parents. They want to be effective. They want to be helpful, right? So the first week is just try to do that. And this is just eight weeks. So hopefully parents keep the book. They keep practicing because we know we want to make a change. It's hard to change habits. It takes a long time. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. So that, that's, that's the start. And then it's and not responding necessarily, just watching their mind and paying attention to how they're feeling and taking care of that and realizing that, you know, if they're annoyed, maybe their teen needs attention. They're playing their music really loud and you get annoyed. Maybe they need attention. So when they're not doing something that annoys you, give them attention. If you get angry, maybe it's a power struggle. Maybe they need more power. Maybe they you're not giving them more say in the household. You're not listening to them more. You're not seeking their advice more. So they feel disempowered. Yeah, I've heard that uh, a lot of times when a child is acting out you actually have to give them more responsibility. <laughs> right. Then, yeah. Well, they say chores are really indicative of children's success yeah. if they had chores. Another one is if you feel hurt. Usually if you get in a fight, then somebody's feelings are hurt. We get into parenting styles. Are you a permissive parent? Are you an authoritarian parent? Not authoritative mm-hmm. because you are in charge, but the th- like you do it my way or the highway. Or you're like, okay, you're a teenager now. You're on your own. There's a lot of groundwork. Mm-hmm. And then... Then you get to problem solving. Then you get to issues. And some of the issues aren't really the issue. It's deeper issue. It's like wanting to be in control or not feeling heard. It's not about their friends not picking them up on time. It's that I'm not in control if they're late. You know, I don't know what to do. And it's letting them um, sometimes make a decision, make mistakes, Mm. knowing that's okay. It's a way to learn. (laughs) It sounds like it starts out with 
mindfulness of being aware of the parent being aware of <laughs> what they're thinking and learning to watch that and slow down if they're reactive in some way, if they're activated, angry, uh, hurt, etc. And then compassion, trying to find a compassionate way of responding rather than defensive or authoritarian. <laughs> so these sound like very Buddhist principles. Are these? Is this a, an area of overlap in psychology or is it something you brought to the process based on your own Buddhism? I think I can't help. See, I got into Buddhism before I went to grad school and became a therapist. So I think it can't help but inform the way I do the therapy. So even though I read the same book somebody else might read, I think of it in terms of, oh, being a Buddhist is an inner being. Mm -hmm. Like we understand that the mind is principle. It's not our speech. It's not our body. It's our mind. And so we have to understand what our mind is doing in order to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy and everybody deserves respect. Like I say to this to parents, I say, if you're coming here to figure out how you can manipulate your teens to get them to do what you want, then this isn't for you. This is genuinely having an interest in them, being curious about what they're saying, that you can actually learn something from them, that they are intelligent, that they do know, and they have had experiences and you want them to become an adult, so you have to start treating them like one. Can you give a specific example of a parenting experience that was a success? That somebody reported that the class worked well for them and how it helped them with their teen? I think any time parents can stay calm, <laughs> not get frustrated, not, not part of parenting is you know offering protection and safety, but not overly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, being really attuned to, the, to your kid's emotional state of mind, like... They need that to grow up and have good attachment. They need to be able to learn that if you can comment, oh, it sounds like you're really angry. And they go, no, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. Then they start to be able to clarify within themselves, you know, what's going on. The success comes where the parent is genuinely in tune with that. Like they're not mm -hmm. just still on their own agenda. They're actually just paying attention. Like one said, you know, my, my teen was talking like because we were supposed to watch our mind. I could feel myself getting angry. And so when he finished, he wanted me to respond. I didn't respond because I knew that I would come from a place of anger. So I was waiting. I was checking up. And my child said, uh, Mom, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> so to me, that's a success. Like she was modeling, don't speak if you think it's going to cause problems. So she was modeling thinking about what she was going to say. And another one was, uh, so th this one parent went home and said, yeah, I hadn't talked to my teenage boy. He wouldn't talk to me or anything. But at dinner, he started talking about baseball. And I, I don't like baseball. I don't like baseball at all. But I started paying attention and asking him questions. And it was the best conversation we'd ever had. So it, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. You're connecting. You're showing interest. That's one of those steps, too, after the attunement that you're championing their self-development. You have delight in them. So it's doing those things, and that's building his ability to self-reflect, or hers, or theirs. You're modeling. It's giving them a chance to learn to take care of themselves. That's so nice. A couple examples. Yeah, so more towards the direction of respect, connection, compassion, <laughs> empathy. Focusing on those values, then how am I going to get my kid to take out the trash or something like and that? And it does yeah. take the parent slowing down yeah. taking some deep breaths, having the time, taking the time. If you get an opportunity, if they come to you and want to talk, make time. See it as precious, you know, to have, have those opportunities. And then listen with curiosity and learning instead of judgment. Watch out for fear-based parenting, which is like, what, you went to a party where they were drinking? <laughs> Mom, you said I could talk to you about anything. <laughs> You're yeah. never going there again. <laughs> the, this kind of advice, I also like how, if you're interested in Buddhism, you've heard this type of advice before. But what I like about it is there, there isn't so much to remember. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it becomes actually quite a simple amount of things to remember and enact. It's not a big list of if this happens and that happens, and if they're anxious, if they're afraid. It's just pay attention to myself first. How am I feeling? Pause if I'm activated in some way that's going to cause more trouble and then maybe just listen <laughs> and ask questions yeah. you yeah. know help your kid express whatever's inside of them it's like a big toolbox right the training because if it's their problem it's good to define that whose problem is this 
if it's their problem, if they're having a problem with a friend or they're frustrated over their homework or they dyed their hair red or maybe you get a call home that they were tardy, but whose problem is it? And they can't get up in the morning and you're always waking them up. You're always giving, whose problem is that? That's their problem. They need to get up. So you define whose problem it is. If it's their problem, what do you do when that problem comes up? You do reflective listening. That's your mm-hmm. first thing to do. You listen. You pay attention. Oh, it sounds like you got in a fight with your friend today. You reflect how you see them feeling. Looks like you're kind of down today. Something happened at school? I don't want to talk about it. Okay, I just, I noticed, but if you want to talk about it, I'd like to hear about it. So it's like you listen, you reflect their feelings, and you reflect the meaning. You're not a parrot. Just say exactly back what they said. I had a bad day. You had a bad day. (laughs) (laughs) You you can ask some questions, you know, like open-ended questions. Can you tell me more about it? You know, where were you when you got in the fight with your friend, you know? And then after some reflective listening, it helps you understand the problem and helps them too. Mm. And then maybe you can get into some problem solving. And what do you do? I know I I am thinking of a particular parent I know, (laughs) not in my family, (laughs) who's having trouble with their kid not talking to them. What do you do if that doesn't work and the kid just says, oh, I'm fine. I don't want to talk to you. I would imagine this happens from time to time with parents of teens. It does. There are big changes coming into high school. So there's a lot of peer work. And I always say it's it's like it's never too late to change your parenting style or, or make a connection. But there may be some resentments. This is where it gets into hurt feelings. Like kids can have hurt feelings too, that you got angry and you said something and they're holding on to that still. Mm. It was three years ago, but they don't want to go there. They don't want to go down that road again. So sometimes it, it means parents have to try to think about what they've said. You can't admit, I've had parents that are, well, I was angry, you know, I didn't mean it. It really hurts. It really yeah. hurt them. And they may not be able to tell you it really hurt them. So it's, sometimes it means, look, I, I really want to be able to be there for you. And I want to, I know I've made mistakes. Mm-hmm. I remember this time when I really blew up and I left the house and I didn't tell anybody. You have to get back past the hurt and past the power plays. You really have to work at building up communication. You know, maybe it's quit asking them if their homework's done. Quit asking the same question. How did school go today? You know, maybe it's asking their advice. Mm. It's asking their opinion about things, asking them what they think about something. I mean, sincerely, like you really think they have, and they do, some expertise in relationships that they could help you with somebody at work. Ask different questions. Don't get hung up on, oh, they won't talk to me. It's always, what invitation are you giving them? You've brought this up several times about empowering your teen and giving them agency is often the solution to these challenges. But I like that. That's a very skillful way to get your teen to start talking is to not ask them about themselves if they're clammed up, but ask them for advice. (laughs) But it has to be sincere. It has to be sincere. It can't can't be because you're trying to get them to talk to you. Yeah, it can't be manipulative. Yeah, you have to really, because teenagers, (laughs) maybe you remember being a teen. Oh, yeah. We can see hypocrisy. From a mile away, right? We're full of it ourselves, but we can see it in adults. Like my father would say, oh, you can't use the word stupid. You're going to have to write the definition 10 times. Don't call anybody stupid. Mm -hmm. So the next night at dinner, he says somebody's stupid, Mm -hmm. but he won't hold himself accountable. As a parent, you have to hold yourself accountable. That's really good modeling. It's okay if you make a mistake. It's okay if you, you say you're sorry. It's okay if you apologize. It's okay if you say I screwed up. It's okay. It's got to be okay to screw up. And a lot of parents haven't had, like I said, they haven't had the parenting classes. You know, it's been busy life. So they haven't done a lot of psychological work, maybe. So it's a lot to ask. Yeah. But it often comes out of a feeling of, I'm really worried about my child's future. We're not connecting anymore. There's a lot of loss and worry on the side of the parent. It's it's a good time to make changes <laughs> when we're when we're dissatisfied or worried or Yeah, know. that's a sign, right? That's the truth that's beneath that strong feeling of fear or worry is that it's usually a signal that maybe something has to change. And the whole thing about this parenting class is that you have to change. The parent has to change. Don't try to change your teen. And you don't have to get everybody in the house to agree. You make changes, people are going to try to push you back into your old mode because they're not used to it. Mm -hmm. But if you stick with it, then they have no choice. If you're not arguing back, if you're not yelling, who's there to fight with? Like Aikido. You exhaust the person. (laughs) They exhaust themselves trying to 
not hit you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What are some of the top challenges facing teens today? Has that changed over time? Social media, isolation, things like that. Well, yeah, I mean, the the pandemic was really something. There were some teens who wrote poetry and published it, and some who cooked with their parents and got closer to their parents, got closer to their siblings. But some did withdraw even more. And not only was there a social media problem to begin with, but then there was more social media because of the classrooms. And there's definitely connections with social media. There's a, I think your name is Twinge, T-W-E-N-G-E, who did like a 10-year study, social media, and as the use has gone up with teens, so has depression, suicidality, loneliness, gone up right with it. So she drew this huge correlation. And then another study pointed out that Teens can have that amount of social media time. It's not all bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, I mean, there are people who find mentors online. Like, it motivates them. But also, if they're getting social contact with other human beings, then those effects are minimized. Because mm-hmm. that's the main thing that that takes away from. If that's all they're doing for their social contact is on social media, and they're not getting personal face-to-face, then that's where those, more of those problems come in. But if they're on sports teams, they're in clubs, they have friends they hang out with, they talk to you, that they're getting that training. They're getting that that need met. But it's everything. It's the polarization in the politics. Mm. It's climate. It's, you know, I applied for one college to go to and I got in and they have college coaches and it's such pressure where I am, the high school I work with, to get to college and education is held at such high regard and parents are pushing and they feel this huge stress around that. It's more expensive to go to college. It's harder to get into good colleges. That's why the social, emotional support at home is so important. That's why the parenting class focuses on Mm. having good relationships. So it's interesting what you said about social media, that it's not that social media is inherently bad. There's high correlations with various psychological problems. But if people also have the face-to-face, in-person connections, then it can be lessened or may not even be an issue. I would guess a lot of parents do come talking about social media, kids on their phone, Instagram. I have a feeling your answer is going maybe just the same when I ask how you deal with that problem. What do you say to a parent whose kids lost in their phone and showing some of those psychological signs of distress and isolation? Well, parents have to see whether the, what they're modeling, first off. I mean, if they come home and they're on their laptop, are you eating dinner together? Do you have a policy in the house about, well, let's put all our phones away? And do you do it too? Going to bed with your phone is not a good idea. And some teens will. Teens will feel like you don't respect them if you don't have some kind of guidelines. I suggest rules are made together if they don't want to participate in that process of coming up with the rules, like bedtime or getting off social then you say, well, you're reluctant. I don't want to do it alone, but here's what I'm going to propose for a while because I can see you're not getting up to go to school. I'm getting calls. So now it's becoming my problem because they're blaming me for also your homework. You failed a class. I'm worried about your health. So it's modeling it and it is setting some guidelines and then sticking to them and not forever. And it's not, oh, yeah, you'll get your phone back when I think you're ready. Mm-hmm. You have to really set a time, and the shorter the better, so that it's learning. Discipline is by being a disciple. Mm-hmm. So it's like giving the disciple a chance to learn in a short period of time. And then, okay, let's try it again. And then, So I think it's modeling, and it's having some guidelines around it, and everybody's participating in the family. You mentioned the environment, which is a newer, it's not necessarily a newer problem, but it's certainly something I see younger people in great despair (laughs) over today in a way that we didn't feel the same way when I was a teenager, although we were concerned. Can you talk about how to address that kind of issues as a parent, kids who are upset and anxious about the environment? As a parent. Or as a teen, too, both ways. Maybe that's a nice transition because you work directly with teenagers also. When kids come to you directly about these issues, how do you talk about the environment? Well, some people deny there's a problem at all. So then again, it depends on the family. Can you create, if there's not one already, a climate (laughs) in your household (laughs) that is (laughs) pollution-free? Can you create one in your mind to start with? 
<laughs> Let's start there. Like we said at the beginning, clear up clouds of anger that causes pollution, mental pollution in our environment. Like really work on cleaning up the climate in your household where there's more love and there's more light and there's more playfulness and there's more joy. When I was in college, we protested if there were things going on. You don't see so many kids protest anymore. We were against the Vietnam War. We protested. It's like taking action, empowering. Okay, there's always going to be problems. There's always some problem, right? So what are we going to do about it? You know, what can we do about it? Can we do something in our household to not use certain products to cut down? Should we get an electric car? What can we do? First, it has to become into awareness. And then it's what action are we going to take? Mm -hmm. But I like the mental pollution. That's also in line with Buddhism, right? Clean up your own pollution first. His Holiness says that. Point the finger at yourself. What can I do to clean up things? It goes again with this theme of empowerment that you keep bringing up. And it goes counter a little bit to some of the, the things we see on TV and in our leaders, mostly often only talking about the faults of other people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rather, yeah. Rather than like even their own virtues or what we can do about problems. So that's your advice is actually to become empowered. But also clean up your own pollution. Yeah, clean up your own pollution. Because, you know, in Buddhism, they are talked about as pollutions. They're polluting our mind. Our mind is basically clean, clear, yeah. and uh, pristine. And because of the way we misconstrue things, it gets clouded over by our greed and our anger. And so even if we go protest, if we're still full of greed and anger and hostility and ignorance about how things are connected, then are we going to do much good? <laughs> That's where I got to when I came out of Berkeley after the protests, is I didn't like the violence. And His Holiness talks about that. We have to disarm ourselves first. Yeah, I had the same experience when I, after the, um, which Gulf War are we talking about? <laughs> I think maybe the second one. <laughs> um, I went to a protest I thought I was going to a peace protest. That's what I thought it was for. But there were people who had signs that said, kill George Bush. And that really dismayed me <laughs> as a, an aspiring peace activist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that bothered me too. Earlier, you talked about learning from your teenager, being open to learning from your teenager. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what we can learn from our teenagers? My uh, law and ethics professor said to me once, he said, don't believe anything your client says. <laughs> So you don't have to buy in. It's a perspective and it's really affecting them. It's their experience right now. So it's important to take things seriously when people talk to you. But you can still have this understanding that it's a perspective. You don't have to totally freak out that it's so there's take them seriously. Be playful. Have a good time. Enjoy it. Don't get so worried. I think those are things to learn. Whatever you're doing, if you're anxious then they feel anxious. If they, like, they don't want to worry you. If they feel like they don't want to worry you with their problems, that's not good. I think learning from them is like not buying into uh, theories about teens. There are these theories that they only operate out of their uh, amygdala, fight and flight, and their prefrontal cortex isn't developed. And so they're illogical, and they take risks, and they lie, and they're all over the place. There's even a book written, Yes, Your Teen Is Crazy. <laughs> And so if like believing that, if that helps you be in a more effective parent, like somehow it says, okay, I'm not going to get wrapped up in this right now. I'm going to stay calm. I'm going to give space. I'm going to respect that they're going through something. If it helps you that way, okay. If it makes you like discount them, no, they're just crazy. Then it's not good. There's other theories that say, National Geographic did a study that it's actually evolutionary that kids take risks. Mm -hmm. Teenagers take risks. It helps them, you know, experimenting and find new ways to do things. And so it's really a evolutionary, wonderful thing. It's adaptive, yeah. Yeah. And then another one was they did this study on teens and they use a lot of drugs and they're reckless and they're promiscuous and they do dangerous things. They did that same study on some middle-aged people and there were the same statistics <laughs> suicide rates, alcoholism. So is, is it an age or is like just be careful about? I learned not to put a label, think you know what they are. Get to know them as a person, who are they, are unique, what's going on, and deal with situations, not like, I told you never to do that, or you're going to end up living under a bridge. No, just deal with the situation. The problem's the problem then, not, oh, you'll never figure this out. Or It's like, you know, one thing to think those things, another is to say them in front of your teens. Mm -hmm. So it's like having this respect that, 
you don't know what's going to happen. They have their own destiny. There's many people that they come in contact with that influence them and in good ways too. And so you don't know maybe the half of what's going on for them. I think that's applicable to everybody though. A lot of the parenting stuff is like applicable to anybody we meet. So we get away from ageism. Like how do I treat my teen? Same way you treat your coworker or somebody on the street you meet. Be nice. They're just like you. Get to know them. Be interested. Be curious. Something you said to me is that it takes nine adults <laughs> yeah. to raise one child. I really appreciated hearing that. And I'm not sure every kid has nine adults in their life. So how do we build that circle of adults to help our kids grow up healthy and whole and, and so on? Yeah, I said that because the vice principal at a junior high school said that to me once. I did the same thing you did. I scratched my head mm -hmm. and went... How did you come up with nine? And I didn't ask them. Maybe she just made it up in the moment. But partly what uh, hopefully it's saying. I think parents sometimes feel like it's their whole responsibility, that they're totally alone and looking after their kids. And mm -hmm. no one else cares and no one else is doing what needs to be done. And that I think that loses sight that there are a lot of people who care. There are there are teachers. I have students still come back. and They've graduated from college and they still come back to the high school. And they talk to me. They talk to teachers. So they have these connections. They still have these this influence, positive influence. Also, most people think peer pressure is negative, but I've seen a lot of positive peer pressure. Mm -hmm. So I think you could include, it doesn't have to be adults. We don't just have, say, nine adults, but nine people who inspire them or mentor them or are a good example to them. So one teen said that he was had been mean to his parents, like to his mom. He didn't talk very nicely to her, and we're all going, wow. And then he said, yeah, but one day my friends came home with me, and they saw this, and then later when we left, they said, why are you so mean to your mom? And it made him change. It got him to change. It made mm -hmm. him think about it and reflect on it. Yeah, why? Like, why are you being mean to your mom? So that's I would count that as part of those nine. That's great. You know? That's great. And sometimes your kid is a mentor to somebody else. Sure, you, yeah. They were at a party and they come home and they tell you, oh, there was drinking at the party and you get upset with them. They shouldn't be there. It's a bad influence. Ask them how they dealt with it. Yeah, I remember. It reminds me of a funny story. <laughs> when my parents, when I was early teen, they banned me from one of my friends because they said he was a bad influence. <laughs> so then I said, but you're depriving him of my good influence. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think he was a bad influence on you? No. I think even then I had a sense that I make my own choices. And I think we were both good influences on each other. And I think that's a good point, Scott. It's like being careful not to just focusing on one thing yeah. or making battles. <laughs> yeah. When it's not a battle. Hair color, say. Like they dye their hair red. Do you need to really make an issue? Like you're not leaving this house with that hair like that. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, usually with those things, the less you react, the better. Yeah. I wanted to switch gears a little and ask you about your teacher. You know, a lot of what you've said is infused with very practical Buddhist wisdom. Your teacher was Lama Yeshe, who was the founder of the organization that I've also studied in for a long time, the FPMT. You talked about how important with Buddhism it is to have a direct teacher, like an in-person, face-to-face relationship. Can you talk just a little bit about your teacher, about Lama Yeshe, and what you learned from him and what it was like studying with him. Yeah, there's a lot that I'll leave out, but just because of there's so much. We realized we wanted to learn more about Buddhist meditation, and we'd heard about Kopan in Kathmandu, Kopan Monastery, and Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa. We were in Nepal, but we didn't connect at that time. We didn't hear about them then. It wasn't until we got to Australia in 1974, and then we were going to go to Nepal. And then friends of ours came back. We ran into them by accident. I'm doing quotes. Yeah. And they said, oh, no, you don't have to go to Nepal. They're coming here in six months, and we'll pick you up and drive you to Queensland, to Chen Rezig Institute. That's where we first met. It was 1974. And they were a team at that time, Lama Zopa and Lama Yeshi. So Lama, Lama Zopa was teaching traditional kind of Lamrim. They're sort of like the four thoughts that turn the mind. Mm -hmm. I like that expression from another tradition. but it's, And it did. It turned my world upside down. We have a very precious opportunity. It's impermanent. We could die at any time. There's lots of suffering. A lot of our life is suffering, even when we think we're having fun. Sometimes it's out of grasping and greed and trying to hold on to it, which causes more 
Probably we want money and then we get it and then we have to protect it and keep it from other people stealing it and then cause an effect and it makes a difference what you do. And so that could kind of bring you down a little bit. You know, like all of a sudden your mind is in a jumble. And then Lama Yeshi would come in about, these were a month long. He'd come in about once a week and he would just show you what it could, what it would look like if you were free of mm-hmm. all this. <laughs> so joyous, laughing and having a good time. And he could just really show what, what it would be like to let go, to be free, to not be holding on so much. And, and he had been through, he'd studied all of this and it showed that it was valuable to, to learn right? He was very good with anybody in any situation. He really, even though he was a Tibetan monk, they're celibate in the Galupa tradition, he would go swimming with us in the ocean. He would go to put on a cowboy hat or a kimono, a a woman's dress, and he would pull a slot machine in Las Vegas. He could have a good time. It wasn't like this austere monk. It was like, you can enjoy life if you can not be so attached and not thinking your happiness comes from outside. Not that. He knows that happiness comes from your own mind and how you view things. And it sounds like Lama Yeshe did what you say parents should do, which is to <laughs> give their children more responsibility. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think so. It was definitely his children, like spiritual father, yeah. mentor. Yeah, yeah, you're right. All right. And so, then uh, the meditation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought, you know, it's fitting with the parenting and teens. This would be a good one for teens, too, because I tell you, they get so wrapped up into BFF, best friend forever, and I hate that person, and don't like my parents, and there was one, I got to share this story. Sure. There was one student who told me there was this teenage code. I asked him about a teenage code, and I know it's different for different teens, but he was like not the best of grades, and he got caught smoking one time. Anyway, so he says... Teenage code is you don't like school, you experiment with drugs, you take risks, you don't like your parents. And I went, wait, 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 you don't like your parents? And he said, well, I used to not like my parents. I like them now. Uh, Wait, 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 you like them now? Why? And he said, one time I got caught smoking at brunch outside. of. You can't leave campus at brunch. So he gets caught smoking cigarettes off campus by the police, gets cited by the police, gets brought to school, and gets suspended. That's being that's two penalties for the same crime. Anyway, so he's walking out to his car because his mom's got to pick him up. He said, "Now my mom's gonna bust my chops, and I'm gonna get grounded, and she's gonna be so mad at me." He walks out to the car, opens the door, gets in, and she says, "We'll get through this together." So I think for parents. And teens, it's trying to keep some equality or equilibrium when we get caught up in friend, enemy, stranger, when Mm. we're calling people, labeling people, friend, enemy, stranger. And this is the first step. Wonderful thing about Buddhism meditation psychology is, for me, is that it gives you ways to develop more compassion, more love. And this is the first step. Like just, first we have to level the playing field that, you know, and anyway, I'll get into it in the meditation, but... First, we have to see that we're all in the same boat. Mm. Then we can develop some appreciation and we can develop some love and some compassion for them. Equanimity. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice to, I think it's a nice takeaway that for parents, there might be one sentence you could say to your teen that to switch them from hating you to thinking you're all right. We'll get through this together. (laughs) Yeah, we'll get through this together. That's a good one to remember. Yeah, instead of feeling like, they failed you or you failed. Yeah. Parents fall into that sometimes. One of the four things to avoid when we're talking about watching your own mind and what emotions you're in. It's also to see what kind of um, unquestioned assumptions we might have mm-hmm. or limiting beliefs we might have. If we fall into exaggeration, like this is the worst thing that could happen. He got busted by the police. He's never going to go to college. He's going to end up living under a bridge. That's exaggerating. So catch yourself. Oh, I'm exaggerating. Okay, just calm down. It's just he got caught for smoking. Maybe it's good he got caught. Next thing is, I can't stand it. This is it. Last week, it was something else he got in trouble with. Now this, I can't stand it. You can stand it. You've been through a lot. You gave birth to him. That was pretty tough. So understand that you can, you have the capacity. If you say you can't, you're going to talk yourself into not being able to do it. Mm -hmm. So the next one is that this shouldn't happen. This should not be happening to me or to to him. He didn't do anything. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to argue. He shouldn't be suspended. And then the last one is blaming, like either blaming him or blaming yourself. I'm not a good parent. 
he's not a good son. It's a situation. Just deal with the situation. Don't catastrophize. Don't make it global. It's just happened. We'll get through it together. We're a team. That's a good list. That's a good list to take away. All right, Rich. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful interview, and I think it's going to be super helpful for parents and teens. And also, if you're just a human being who relates to other human beings, this yeah. is generally useful advice. Thanks a lot, yeah. Rich. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you.